Hello, I'm Dr. Lori Labaca, and I'm going to talk to you today about linguistic anthropology. I'll briefly talk about the field in general, and then I'll talk about some of my work on food in prison. And if you're wondering how food in prison is related to linguistic anthropology, then stay tuned and I will let you know. Linguistic anthropology is a subfield of anthropology that is interested in answering anthropological questions through language. For instance, looking at the language people use in interactions with one another or in the media to answer questions like how culture changes over time or how societal power dynamics are created and maintained. So linguistic anthropologists are interested in the social and cultural meaning of language, not necessarily the grammatical meaning. Quick example. If you live in the United States, you may be familiar with different terms used to refer to a sweetened carbonated beverage. People in Chicago tend to say pop, people in the Southwest often say soda, and people in the South may say Coke. So when you say one of those words, you're saying something about yourself, where you're from, or maybe where you see yourself as from. None of them are right or wrong, but they have a different social meaning. And that's what linguistic anthropologists are interested in. So I'll talk very briefly about some of my work. I did about a year of ethnographic field work with women incarcerated in a uh, state prison in the southwestern United States. I did interviews, focus groups, and participant observation. Participant observation is basically hanging out. Um, so I would go and hang out with women who were interested in participating and see how they navigated daily life in prison. What I'm gonna talk about specifically are these vending machine meals. So often, if you visit someone who's incarcerated, you can't bring outside food in, but there are vending machines located in visitation and you can bring quarters and purchase food from those vending machines to share with your incarcerated loved one. The vending machines had, you know, chips, candy, soda, there's that word soda, uh, and they also had fancier stuff like chicken alfredo, burritos, and there were microwaves so you could heat that stuff up. Now the prison only provided breakfast and dinner on the weekends. Um, that's what we call state issue, what the prison provides. They did not provide lunch. So a lot of women who had visits, a lot of women didn't have visits or rarely had visits, but if you did, uh, you often really depended on that vending machine meal to replace that lost lunch and not be hungry on the weekend. I think for a lot of us, when we think about prison food, we think of it as not great, kind of gross. Um, there's actually a policy reason for that. So way back in the 1990s, uh, there were a bunch of policies passed at the state level, the local level, the federal level that really limited the basic necessities that were provided in these carceral facilities. So food, medical care, hygiene, things like that. And a lot of those policies are still in place. Um, the prison that I worked at, uh, the food was really lacking both in quality and quantity. So if you look at this picture, that's actually um, from a jail where I did some field work, but the prison food is very similar. Um, it's kind of watery, not very appetizing, questionable ingredients. And the important thing is that many of the women that I worked with found this food disgusting. Um, some thought it could make them sick, but many just thought it was gross. And of course, it's not a lot of food. So what's provided by state issue just calorically isn't enough to sustain the average individual. And so what I saw was that women had a lot of ways socially, culturally, and linguistically to create alternative relationships with food. Um, and of course, food is important to all of us, right? To our identity and our culture and how we see ourselves. And quickly, um, I just wanna show you, these are tamales that incarcerated women made. Um, so they would come together and bring the ingredients that they could get their hands on, um, which are very limited, usually from commissary, and the small amount of tools available, right? There's not a kitchen to use, and they would make these very rich, uh, elaborate, culturally significant and traditional foods. Um, so I know that the masa for the tamales was made of crushed up Doritos mixed with water. They also made a lot of menudo. And now I'm gonna talk about some of the linguistic ways that um, women distance themselves from that state issue diet. 
Um, so one of the ways we all create our identities and say something about ourselves is through narratives. We tell stories that say something about who we are and how we fit into society. And one of the things that some of the women I worked with did was to create narratives of indulgence, um, telling stories about eating lots and lots of wonderful food as if food was overabundant. They would tell these stories um, both with their families at visitation over those vending machine meals and also with one another on the yard. And so I'm going to talk about one of these stories. This is an interaction between China and her aunt at visitation. Linguistic anthropologists like to transcribe interactions so that we can see what's going on linguistically. I'm just going to briefly read this and then we'll talk a little bit about it. So China says, Mmm, one week last week when my mom came, I ate so much. <laughs> I swear, I felt like she brought, probably brought like almost 20 bucks and quarters. I was like, and her aunt says, wow. China says, so maybe like 15, 20, it was somewhere around there. And I say, wow. Because I mean, I had two sodas, a bag of chips, popcorn, a candy bar, burr, bean and cheese burrito. I had, um, and her aunt steps in and says, the hot fries. China says, the hot fries. I had, uh, <laughs> And her aunt says, were you, were you sick? China shakes her head and says, I was like, my mom's like, you gonna be sick? And her aunt says, mm-hmm, and then I laugh. And then she goes on. So this is not necessarily the narrative we would imagine in the context of limited food, like maybe a narrative of hunger and desperation or dependence, but it's almost the opposite, right? China's talking about all this really good food she had and her aunt is participating in the narrative, what we call co-constructing the narrative. So in line 10, she steps in and adds hot fries to China's list of foods that she had. And then in line 13, she elevates the narrative to indicate this was enough food to make somebody sick. And together they create this narrative of indulgence and position China as someone who is able to indulge in an excess of pleasurable foods. Then we get to the big, so what question. Why does this matter? Are women engaging in these social and linguistic practices just to get enough food, uh, just to prevent being hungry? I argue that these cultural and linguistic practices tell us something about how prison power operates. So in these narratives and in these cultural practices, we can see that the prison diet itself is inherently humiliating. The limited quality and quantity paints a picture of a desperate dependent prisoner who like has to eat this gross nasty food. So the basic human need of eating becomes a punishment in this context. And through these narratives and other social practices, women are resisting that humiliation and saying that they are worthy. They're trying to maintain their sense of self, trying to say that they're worthy of culturally rich relationships with food. And they're also trying to maintain their humanity. They're saying that they're human. They're claiming the kinds of relationship with food many of us take for granted. The other thing we can see is that the inside outside binary that so many of us have when we think about prisons, like prisoners are inside separate from the outside world, just isn't there in reality. Um, so in this instance, we have visitors coming in, uh, interacting with those who are incarcerated, and also spending a lot of money. The cost of maintaining contact and supporting someone who is incarcerated can get quite staggering. And that often present, prevents people uh, from keeping ties to the community while they're incarcerated, which then exacerbates difficulties after release. Um, so not only are there vending machine meals, um, but you also have the cost of traveling for visitation, phone calls cost money, hygiene, medical care, and commissary, right? So to have, to buy food from commissary, somebody has to put money on your books. There's also a fee for putting money on somebody's books. So we can see a lot of the cost of incarceration has been transferred from the state to the families and communities that have incarcerated loved ones. And what this is doing is really entrenching poverty for some of the lowest class members of society because prisoners overwhelmingly come from poor and disenfranchised communities. And so again, that cost of maintaining contact with someone incarcerated can get really expensive. And that cost is being borne by those already disenfranchised communities. Okay. 
That's all I have. I hope you got a little picture of what linguistic anthropologists do. Thank you very much.